Okay, we're ready to go. I grew up traveling this thing. All I had to play up with Burger King. I hate this. Genius. Imagine by his own cold survival. Okay, we watched about 10 or 15 minutes of this. We did watch the Medici a little bit. We watched the Medici a little bit. I wish we had time to watch all of this. We just don't have that much time. So let's check out and see what's going on in 1479. Okay, Arrested on prompt of sodomy charges, Leonardo da Vinci endures a damaged reputation. And then Florence itself is thrown into danger as war erupts with Naples. To punish the Medici for the execution of one of his archbishops, Pope Sixtus sends King Ferdinand of Naples to invade Florence and attack this smaller Florentine army. The Florentine forces, mostly mercenaries, fight with the sustained violence of professional killers. But the more powerful army of Naples quickly take the upper hand, smashing into the Florentine forces with unforgiving savagery. In the terrible aftermath, it is clear to Lorenzo that the city's plight is desperate. His troops are being cut to pieces. He must find a way to end this war and somehow save Florence. It seems the larger political landscape may provide Lorenzo with a way out. The Muslim Ottoman Empire, greatly feared by the Christian Europeans, has threatened the entire peninsula for some time. Florence, Naples, and the Papal States are all at risk. In a bold and dangerous move, Lorenzo travels to confront King Ferdinand of Naples, face to face, attempting to convince him that the Italian states should be unified against the Turks rather than fighting each other. If he fails in his mission, Florence is finished. The risk was significant. He could have died. He could have been taken hostage while he was gone. He could have been replaced by usurpers. Intrigued, but unconvinced, the king has him arrested while he considers the proposal. Back in Florence, Da Vinci, like everyone else, is caught up in the tension and anxiety of impending war. He begins designing ladders and other devices for defending and scaling walls. These ladders are designed to carry two men. They are also useful for a tower, where you might fear that a rope ladder could be detached by the enemy. It's all engineering, 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 because that's sort of the reality of Italy at the time that being out is alive. You have all these different warring city-states. Uh, warfare is a constant fact of life. Da Vinci labors on and waits, putting his active mind to work on defensive fortification and other weapons of war. Three months pass with no word of Lorenzo de' Medici. In the streets of Florence, the citizens wait in fear. The weeks drag on without news of their leader or their larger fate. The people go about their business as hope dwindles. The Medici dynasty and Florentine independence soon doomed. They knew what their situation was. When Lorenzo is in the king of an opponent, they must have been nervous. He could lose his wealth. He could lose the city. The Florentines could lose the city. 
And then a commotion rolls through the streets. In triumph, Lorenzo returns, having convinced King Ferdinand of Naples to end the war. The crowd celebrates his courage and statesmanship. Lorenzo the Magnificent has pulled Florence back from the brink. As peace at last comes to Florence, Leonardo receives a commission to paint the adoration of the Magi, an altarpiece for the monastery at San Donato Ascoli. It is his first important work. We have the Adoration of the Magi treated like nobody has really conceived this event before. Among the turmoil of figures that are surrounding the kind of serene Virgin and Child, this frenzy of devotional attention, there are rearing horses, the turmoil of men and horses. He forms the composition almost in a square with a triangle made up of the Virgin and kneeling kings. But here, Leonardo is using the body of the horse to invest his composition with dynamic motion and energy, a sense of frenzy, the sense that this is almost like an apocalyptic event in the incarnation. Tantalizingly, some scholars think the standing figure of the young man on the bottom right may be a self-portrait of the young Leonardo. The work is considered an overture, a first statement of Leonardo's great work to come. But it doesn't go well. After devoting extraordinary time to the underpainting, he leaves it unfinished. His notebooks suggest his reason. To conceive an idea is noble. To execute the work is servile. Somebody who's intensely curious, uh, restless, doesn't like to stay at one thing. The point at which something's ready to be finished is the point at which it's no longer interesting. He was much more interested in the natural world, in the mechanical world, and only painted uh, occasional paintings when he seems to have a cash flow problem. It is a bad time for Da Vinci to abandon his painting. Lorenzo de' Medici is considering artists for a plum assignment, a trip to Rome to help decorate the Pope's Sistine Chapel. It is the kind of commission that a young artist like Leonardo could only dream of, a real chance to shine before the most powerful patrons in Italy. Lorenzo's choice will affect Leonardo's future and shape his destiny with better or for worse. Even as word of Leonardo da Vinci's talent spreads, he appears to lose interest in his career. An important commission is not completed. Clients grow angry. And when Lorenzo the Magnificent chooses his finest artists to send to Rome, Da Vinci is not selected. The Adoration of the Magi is one of the great masterpieces of the High Renaissance, and yet Leonardo was unable to finish it, and some believe that he had conceptualized the end of the painting in his mind, and that was enough for him, rather than actually going to the brush and doing it physically. And so, he found himself in lawsuits a number of times because he couldn't finish his work. He cannot deal with the ordinary conditions of production, of clientage, uh, of contract, supplying works to deadline uh, according to a patron's specifications. But he didn't finish it. Psychologists today have names for these things. Perhaps he was ADD. Perhaps he was obsessive. Maybe he was anxious. Maybe he was depressed. We don't know exactly what his ailment was, but it seemed to be something afflicting his mind. It seems that Da Vinci's greatest gifts, his restless imagination, and endless stream of ideas complicate his drive for success. 
Again, circumstances hold him back, and he must find another way to achieve his goals. You're not really sure he wanted to be an artist. And that was his inroads into the court life and into the patronage life. Uh, but when he gets there, he almost kind of leaves it behind. Unsatisfied with painting, Da Vinci decides it is time for a change. His code demands that he find another channel for his ambition. He needs a fresh start and new opportunities. And so he travels to Milan. As the most northern of the Italian states, Milan is the most vulnerable to foreign invaders. And so it is heavily militarized, a center for weapons production and military technology. As he moves to the armorous stalls in the streets of Milan, Da Vinci finds a vibrant city, always on the brink of battle, always ready to defend itself, not just from rival city-states, but from the superpower of France as well. In the tools of war, large and small, Da Vinci sees a future he could not realize in Florence. Italy is a theater of war as local powers call in the bigger powers of Europe with disastrous results. In the royal palace of Milan, a letter arrives. Carefully worded and boastful in tone, it presents to the acting Duke Ludovico Sforza the credentials of Leonardo da Vinci. Not as an artist, but as a genius military engineer. I have plans for extremely light and strong bridges, adapted to be most easily carried. I have plans for making mortars, easy to transport, and able to fling small stones, almost resembling a storm, and creating smoke terrifying to the enemy. Where a bombardment of cannon might fail, I can make catapults and other machines of marvelous accuracy and not in common use. Da Vinci's designs are visionary. His covered assault car is an improvement of an earlier well-known idea, but it will take 400 years before the concept is realized as the modern tank in World War I. Da Vinci describes the machine in his notes. I will make covered chariots, which will be impervious to any body of men at arms who try to shatter it when attacking the enemy with artillery. The real innovation is its mobility, hand cranked by men or horsepower. The cranks attached to horizontal wheels, geared to the four driving wheels. Close examination shows that Da Vinci's design has drawn would have the drive wheels turning in opposite directions, an arrow, or a means to confuse an enemy that might steal his designs. We have repertory of drawings uh, made by Leonardo, showing savage-looking uh, instruments of warfare, chariots with sides that you know, slash through the flesh of an enemy army. It is an improvement of the old Roman-style chariot by adding an upright lantern gear with four huge side blades mounted above, like a curved blade helicopter. Da Vinci's design for a cannon shows hundreds of swarming bodies, dwarfed by the colossal bronze gun, and reveals one of Leonardo's obsessions. He loved scale, um, loved to speculate and, and dream about things on scale, just be vastly beyond that of the period. So he has these gigantic speculative designs for incredible killing machines. Da Vinci's fantastical weapon designs are typical of his continual pushing beyond the ordinary, always dreaming in the extreme. In his life, it will be a pattern, a part of his code. Never be limited by what has been done before or what others might. He certainly sells himself as somebody who has secrets, somebody who knows the technology of military engineering, making guns, making weapons. Da Vinci hopes 
that Ludovico Sforza, the acting Duke of Milan, will commission him to build these war machines. Ludovico Sforza is the brother of the assassinated Duke of Milan. He's acting as the regent, basically the effective ruler of Milan. And he's basically controlling the defense policy, the foreign policy of Milan State. Ludovico will hold power only until his timid nephew, young Galeazzo, comes of age, if he ever does. Touché. Adesso vai pure. Ho degli affari a spiegare. I think everybody expects that the one thing that Ludovico really wants is the Duke of Milan. Uh, he's prepared to go to extraordinary lengths to get him. But the armies of kings and the cruel uncertainty of politics will overturn Ludovico's dreams of glory and everything that Da Vinci has bought for him.
get stuck on one, let me know. Talk quietly so the bell rings. Make sure that's finished. They're great at first thing you come in tomorrow. 